This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Okay, we're back. We're live. We're here on Energy in America here on Think Tech on a Wednesday afternoon in the three o'clock block with Lou Puglierisi. He's the CEO of EPRINC, an energy policy think tank in Washington, D.C., and he's taking time off for a conference to join us, and we really <laughs> appreciate that, Lou. Thank you very much. <laughs> Happy to be here, Jay. <laughs> so um, it was very interesting this week. Um, we heard that the administration was repealing some regulations adopted during the Obama period, um, pushing uh, the, um, uh, what do you call it, CAFE standards from 30 miles yeah. per gallon to 50 miles a gallon, and now that's been repealed, and, and, and they're reconsidering the 50 miles. They may find something else, but we won't know what that is for some time. And, and it, it, it offers all kinds of questions and issues and possibilities, and I'm so glad that we can talk about it with you now. So tell us, what happened? Okay, so I, I think it's very important to talk about what the reality of the corporate average fuel economy is and, and how the regulatory program fits in with that. So if, if you think about this program going back to the, oh, as far back as the Arab oil embargo in the mid-70s, right? the motivation for improving fuel efficiency came out of a sense that uh, we were importing too much oil, which we used to make gasoline, that we were reliant on insecure and expensive sources of foreign oil, and that we should have a program not only, uh, maybe you can recall this, if you remember in the 70s, we ate, nobody could drive more than 55 miles an hour. Oh, sure. We, we, yeah, we had reduced the amount of time people could draw, uh, how fast they could drive. Then... We said, well, you know, we need to make our cars more fuel efficient. And economists always say, well, just put a big tax on. That'll do it. You know, that's what they do in Europe. But we don't like to do things that way. We like to have a kind of stuff mandate. So we had this corporate average fuel economy. But it's very important to remember that its original intent was based on this concern over not necessarily environment, but on uh, our reliance on foreign oil. Yes. Now, at the same time, right, at the same time, uh, you know, going back to the 60s, the government also began to control what comes out of the tailpipe of an automobile. And if you go back to the, uh, you know, 50s and 60s, all kinds of stuff was coming out of the tailpipe. I mean, lead, sulfur dioxide, volatile organic compounds, particulates of all kinds of sizes. And uh, as that process got, got moving, California actually was ahead of the government in many of these sort of tailpipe emissions. We had the end of leaded gasoline, the introduction of the catalytic converter, and, uh, you know, in order to improve what comes out the tailpipe. And in fact, I think a lot of people are, don't really understand how much improvement we have seen on the, uh, on the tailpipe. So I think we should put this uh, slide up right now. Okay, let's put the slide up and, okay, let's put and the examine slide that. Okay, here we go. It's called yeah. Auto Emissions Then and Now. So this slide shows a 1968 four-speed driven by Steve McQueen in the uh, American, you know, detective thriller movie called Bullet. And actually, McQueen did a lot of his own uh, driving, stunt driving for this, for this film. Uh -huh. And if you, if you listen to the soundtrack, which is actually quite interesting, you will hear a lot of double clutching, which you know then the soundtrack was not really related to the movie because... McQueen was driving at four speed. He did not need to double clock. So. <laughs> <laughs> but I very think, macho, though. <laughs> I, yeah, yeah. So I think that the first thing to think about is what's coming out of that tailpipe, right? And in 1968, over 100,000 miles, that car, that 68 Mustang, you know, could emit as much as one ton of criteria pollutants. 
That would be lead, sulfur, uh, volatile organic compounds, particulates, all this stuff. Terrible stuff, right? And today, as you can see, these automobiles are a lot cleaner. Mm -hmm. Maybe a new Mustang probably does not generate more than 10 pounds over 100,000 miles. Wow, that is a big difference. Yeah, that is a big difference. And the reason I'm showing you this slide is so you understand what the motivation was for California to get what was called kind of special treatment or a waiver to the, to the standards, right? Mm -hmm. So California was given a waiver on its regulatory program on what it could come out the tailpipe. And that was an EPA decision that was embedded in the Clean Air Act. California said, look, we have special conditions, and those conditions are smog in the L.A. Basin because we know that even when the Native Americans lived there, there was smog when they barbecued because it's a natural air inversion. Okay, So they got that provision. So that provision, though, is one that EPA could grant. But the CAFE standards, which are, you know, what you, your fuel efficiency, those are actually not issued by EPA. People may not understand this, but those are issued by the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration, or NHTSA for short. So we have this two agencies that are kind of interlocked in a way on this whole regulation of how automobiles perform and that is the core of what happened this week in Washington. Because on April 1st, the Environmental Protection Agency uh, concluded what's called its midterm evaluation. And if you don't recall, at the beginning of the Obama administration, very rigorous CAFE standards were set. Now, what they say they're going to get and what they actually get in real life are two different things. Okay, so the mileage standards are a kind of modeling exercise. They're not really how the automobiles perform in the real world. But the key feature of those regulations was that the, you know, the, if you recall, at the beginning of the Obama administration, the industry was on its back. Uh, GM was essentially bankrupt. And in exchange for you know, getting certain financial concessions from the government, the autos went along with all this stuff, even though they knew they would have a hard time meeting it. Mm -hmm. So, and we're going to take a short break uh, and reconnect with Lou Pugliarisi. He's the CEO of EPRINC, which is an energy policy research organization in Washington, D.C., he joins us every two weeks by uh, Skype, or in this case, Zoom, and voice over inter internet protocol. And uh, we're going to reconnect. We'll be right back to talk some more about the CAFE standards change that happened just this week. Hot news. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. I'm Helen Dora Hyden, the host of Voice of the Veteran, seen here live every Thursday afternoon at 1 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. As a fellow veteran and veterans advocate with over 23 years experience serving veterans, active duty, and family members, I hope to educate everyone on benefits and accessibility services by inviting professionals in the field to appear on the show. In addition, I hope to plan on inviting guest veterans to talk about their concerns and possibly offer solutions. As we navigate and work together through issues, we can all benefit. Please join me every Thursday at 1 p.m. for the Voice of the Veteran. Aloha! You can be the greatest, you can be the best, you can be the king come banging on your chest. You can beat the world, you can beat the war, you can talk to God, go banging on his door. You can throw your hands up, you can beat the clock, you can move a mountain, you can break rocks, you can be a master, don't wait for luck. Dedicate to something you can find yourself.
Hello everyone, Ted Ralston here, a host of our Think Tech show, Where the Drone Leads, where we talk weekly at uh, Thursdays noon, by the way, on subjects related to the emer emerging technology and business of drones, as they might apply here in Hawaii. Uh, issues involving commerce and education, legislation, uh, technology, public safety, all the things that you might want to hear about. Uh, we talk about them with uh, local experts and people from across the country. So join us at uh, noon on every Thursday, and we'll have a new subject, and we'll have uh, new faces to talk about this most interesting subject area. Match day is no ordinary day. The pitch, hallowed ground for players and supporters alike. Excitement builds. Game plans are made with responsibility in mind. Celebrations are underway. Ready for kickoff, MLS clubs and our supporters rise to the challenge. We make responsible decisions while we cheer on our heroes and toast their success. Elevate your match day experience. If you drink, never drive. Freedom, is it a feeling? Is it a place? Is it an idea? At Dive Heart, we believe freedom is all of these and more, regardless of your ability. Dive Heart wants to help you escape the bonds of this world and defy gravity. Since 2001, Dive Heart has helped children, adults, and veterans of all abilities go where they have never gone before. Dive Heart has helped them transition to their new normal. Search DiveHeart.org and share our mission with others, and in the process, help people of all abilities imagine the possibilities in their lives. Welcome to Hawaii. This is Prince Dykes, your host of the Prince of Investing, coming to you guys each and every Tuesday at 11 a.m. right here on Think Tech Hawaii. Don't forget to come by and check out some of the great information on stocks, investing, your money, all the other great stuff, and I'll be your host. See you Tuesday. I just walked by and I said, what's happening, guys? They told me they were making music. Aloha, my name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea. Law Across the Sea comes on every other Monday at 11 a.m. Please join us. I like to bring in guests that talk about all types of things that come across the sea to Hawaii. Not just law, love, people, ideas, history. Please join us for Law Across the Sea. Aloha. Living in this crazy world, so caught up in the confusion, nothing is making sense for me and you. Maybe we can find a way, there's got to be solution, how to make a brighter day. Good afternoon. My name is Howard Wig. I am the proud host of Code Green, a program on Think Tech Hawaii. We show at 3 o'clock in the afternoon every other Monday. My guests are specialists both from here and the mainland on energy efficiency, which means you do more for less electricity and you're generally safer and more comfortable while you're keeping dollars in your pocket. Hello everyone, I'm DeSoto Brown, the co-host of Human Humane Architecture, which is seen on Think Tech Hawaii every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. And with the show's host, Martin Despang, we discuss architecture here in the Hawaiian Islands and how it not only affects the way we live, but other aspects of our life, not only here in Hawaii, but internationally as well. So join us for Human Humane Architecture every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii.
And we're back. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. This is uh, actually Energy in America with Lou Pugliarisi, who joins us now uh, by voice over in, in, in Internet Protocol Voice um, from Washington, D.C. Uh, we're going to talk about, we are talking about the change in the CAFE standards that happened just this week. Very important. So, uh, Lou, uh, you were talking about, you know, the change and what happened in California um, and, and, how, and how the basic focus of this kind of emissions control changed. Can you finish that discussion? Yeah, so, I, I, yeah, so what I really want to do is, and I think it's illustrated by the, the Steve McQueen Mustang uh, 68 and 2016 versions there that we, we saw the, the, the photo of. So, um, so the, the question is automobiles have become extremely clean on tailpipe emissions. And when you listen to the discussion, people you know, in California and, and you know, on both sides, they say, well, this is really a fight between whether we're going to have dirty air or not. But it's not, that's really not what it's a fight about. It's a completely wrong idea. This is a fight about carbon, you know, greenhouse gas emissions. This is what California is seeking a waiver for. And that's why I told the story earlier, because... California got a waiver through the Clean Air Act to deal with smog in the L.A. basin, right, and some maybe San Francisco Bay Area. Mm -hmm. But now they are using that waiver, a kind of what's now called a programmatic waiver, to deal with greenhouse gas emissions. But greenhouse gas emissions are not a local pollution problem in California. Mm -hmm. Actually, carbon is odorless and colorless. So it's really, you know, there are no particulates in carbon. So, mm -hmm. so California is trying to use this waiver for which the administration believes the wrong purpose. After all, UHG emissions is a global climate problem. Whatever ca ca California does on GHG emissions is going to have no effect on the climate. Mm, interesting. So the real fight now is, and if you think about Trump, what is Trump for? He's for populism, nationalism, and industrialism, right? And so the auto industry is a very big, important view of his base. And so uh, the problem is, is that for the auto industry, they really want a single national standard. So by this decision, the administration has first said, well, the existing standards are probably, you know, they're going to go through a rulemaking. They have actually not to say decided what the new standard should be. They're just saying the existing standards, which were heavily backloaded into the regs, which means that most of the heavy lifting occurs over the next five years, five to seven years, uh, that, that, you know, that that's not appropriate. But well, it's very interesting. The, you know, it's very interesting yeah. how the thing kind of backfired on Trump. Because he was trying yeah. to serve the automobile industry, saving the money uh, of R and D and the additional costs and cars and and the you know the the, the pressure on uh, sales um, uh, by trying to reach a 50 mile efficiency. Um, so you know ease it off at 30 miles and and put off the whole issue about whether to whether and what to what extent to increase it later. That that was clearly a gift to the uh, automobile industry. Um, but uh, right. California right. is committed. <laughs> and what, I would think what yeah. happened, which really surprised him, is that the states, yeah. especially California, which doesn't like him too much anyway, uh, said, no, 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 right. we are going to be ahead of you. We have our own standards, um, and it's a higher standard than, than you're proposing in retaining the 30-mile uh, per, per gallon standard. So what, what he created, uh, he created a problem for the auto industry in that now there would have to be two kinds of cars, one in the center right. of the country and one, you know, on the East Coast and West Coast. This is not what well, he intended at all. Well, I think, yeah, I, I don't know how, what he listened to. I mean, I think that's not what he intended. What he wants is uh, a modified uh, standard for the whole country. But as you say, California is not going along with it. But the question, the, the point I wanted to make is, well, the, the rationale, if you like, for California to have a separate standard 
is not based on the traditional waiver authority because of they have a local smog problem. Understand? Mm -hmm. It has nothing to do with that. Mm -hmm. That is where the real fight is going to take place. And how they're going to work this out, we don't know. Remember, the administration has not changed the standard. They have just gone into rulemaking for a new standard. They have just determined that the midterm review, which was put into the law a long time ago, has finished, and the midterm review, uh, that they're concluding, the midterm review says, but the cost of achieving this standard is uh, bad in a couple of ways. It's forcing people to buy cars they don't want to buy, and it's increasing the cost of the average cost of automobiles, and that's actually going to slow the rate at which the fleet turns over. Mm -hmm. So I think those are the, that's the kind of highlight and, uh, of, the, of what the issue is. But there's a kind of inside baseball problem as well which is how will the court, you know, what will the administration do? Are they going to go to court? Are they going to tell California, look, you, you might have had a waiver under EPA for local pollution, but this is a national standard that's going to be set by the National Highway yeah. Transportation. Well, I mean, just in the four corners of this conversation, Lou, it yeah. seems to yeah. me the administration will go to court because it wants to protect the automobile industry. If the automobile industry has to create two kinds of cars, it's going to be very inefficient uh, and very costly to the automobile industry. So they will, yeah. they will go to court and claim that this is a federal area, this is preempted, uh, that the waiver procedure that you described does not apply, uh, and so California should follow the national standard, what, whatever it is, uh, as far as efficiency is concerned. It sounds like they'll have to go. They'll have to go to court, no? Yeah, I agree. And by the way, the net savings in gasoline from this standard and a likely alternative standard is probably not more than I don't know, hundred hundred thousand barrels to one hundred and ten thousand barrels a day on a transportation sector that probably is using 9 million barrels a day, okay? So I think they have a case to be made here that, look, the standard itself is not really reducing consumption of gasoline that much. So you're paying a lot for a relatively low yield. So that, that, that's one issue that needs to be, you know, vetted and explained better. Mm -hmm. And then the, the other question is uh, how, you know, how will EPA propose to modify the standards? And what will be the new standard? We don't know yet, right? Well, one thing, and, uh, one thing is before we had a timeline where everybody could yeah. plan. Before the automobile industry here and overseas knew that by a certain date they had to meet a certain standard. Now all of that is in a cocked hat. We don't know when exactly. they will decide or exactly. what they will decide or when it will be in, 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 in effective. Yeah. So, I mean, if you look at, uh, you know, these, these, uh, these standards are very complicated, and, uh, and, and it's very interesting on how this plays out because I, I do think the administration has a point on the waiver, which is, well, does California really get a waiver for global warming? Yeah, they get a waiver for local pollution, but sh does the law permit them to take a waiver for global warming? Mm -hmm. And uh, we're, we're going, I think only the courts will be able to settle that. Yeah. Well, I mean, do you feel this is a, a good thing? I mean, it, you, it may only be uh, 100 or 110,000 barrels a day, but it, it, that's a lot of barrels. Uh, at least in an absolute sense, and uh, it, this is more of the same from of, Trump. Right, but I do think that, you know, because Trump is proposing it, I understand how people feel. I have the same reaction. But <laughs> I do think that, you know, we talked about this once before. If your strategy is, I mean, what is your objective function on this program, Right. If your objective function is just to save gasoline, the fundamental criteria for that is 
is gone. We are not reliant on foreign sources anymore. We're almost entirely independent. Mm -hmm. We don't have an energy security problem anymore. So this issue should be legitimately thought out on are the environmental benefits worth the cost? But you know, one, one thing... This the most what, one thing that comes to mind on that on that exact issue is this: is uh, if, if I were Obama, you know, and and, and thinking through what he did, uh, the, you know, yeah. the move to fifty, but I, I would know that it was going to cost the industry more money to for that R and D. Uh, that is a very hard standard to achieve, and that means that cars, will, you know, fossil cars will be more expensive. And so I say, in in the in the world of consumer choice, this is actually a motivating feature directing people to renewable energy cars, whether they be electric or hydrogen or what have you. Um, and so if, you, if, if Trump had left it alone, it would have been one of those factors that drives the transportation industry to migrate just a little quicker to electric cars. Now, I think this is a blow the other way, uh, that, this, that taking that standard away and leaving it in a, in a, a kind of uh, amorphous state, which is what he did, um, is actually uh, a move to retain fossil cars and not to push on electric cars. Don't you agree? Well, I think that's really uh, what we, call, you know, small, you know, small beer because electric car sales are not more than one percent. I saw that even the Tesla sales are falling off a bit, and um, yeah, electric. It's not so much electric cars. I don't really think that's the right way to think about it. I think the right way to think about it is that, in the end, implementing this standard would eliminate would have eliminated consumer choice. You can argue whether it's a good or a bad thing. And second, it would have made the average cost of an automobile more expensive, anywhere from one to two thousand dollars per automobile. Right? That would be the net effect. If you look at the data, now, mm -hmm. maybe they could have gotten better at it. And uh, and part of it's driven by the fact that gasoline prices are lower and people don't want to drive small cars. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you're yeah. probably riding around in a zip car or something, but, you know, uh, most people in the middle of the country, they don't want to drive a zip car. They want an SUV. Well, let, let so me... I think there's a legitimate debate on what, okay, what is the value of, uh, of, of uh, you know, limiting the choice? Is it worth it? You know, mm -hmm. and to pay, you know, are you getting value for paying more for these costs? Mm -hmm. Well, let me ask you this, though. I mean, all yeah. of that, shake and bake it, um, where do you think we're going on this? I mean, a couple of things from this conversation are pretty clear. Right now, there is no, um, you know, uh, mandate to go to 50 miles a gallon. Uh, there's no deadline by w by which the the government has to decide, uh, so it's it's going to be stable for a while at at 30 miles a gallon. It's anybody's guess uh, about when it changes. Um, that's that's one thing. The industry, automobile industry, will be happy. Consumers, I suppose, who don't care about this issue, they will be happy. They'll pay just a little less for cars. Uh, the environmentalists will not be happy. But where do you think this is all going to go? Well, I think, you know, this issue is really not, if what you're trying to buy is reduced emissions of global, uh, you know, of uh, greenhouse gas emissions, this is a very costly way to do it. It's a global issue. There are lots of cheaper, lower cost ways to do that. And that we have quite a few subsidies for electric cars now. And so I, I'm generally a person who doesn't really like mandates or requirements. I think that we subsidize electric cars. Uh, you know, there's plenty of producers who want to make them. And it's up to the consumers to decide whether the electric car is delivering uh, for them what they want. And that it's a kind of unidimensional environmental calculation. Mm -hmm. Because to produce, to produce these electric cars, we have to power the grid. In many cases, that's with coal. We have to dig up this lithium around the world, huge amounts of tailings and environmental consequences, and we don't we don't seem to be worried about that. We have a kind of narrow view of the environment. It's not a kind of global calculation. So, uh, yeah, kind of Trump is a kind of problematic character 
in the way he presents these issues. He's very combative, and he's, uh, you know, he doesn't take a lot of time yeah. to explain the subtleties. <laughs> well, there are, you know, and there are other implications that uh, we haven't covered. Yeah. Uh, you know, for example, you know, what happens depending on the result in the litigation, which you and I foresee would happen in California, maybe other states as well. Yeah. Uh, and whether there has to be two that kinds are lined of lined up with California, right? Yeah. So there's ten states that are in in, in the go with California. So. Yeah. And finally, um, how does this affect manufacturers overseas who are trying to sell in this country? Uh, they've been ramping up to the 50 miles, and now they don't have to. Uh, I guess they would be happy. Um, but what's the comparison between uh, the, the cars they make uh, here and there, and uh, not only in Asia, but in Europe? So, I mean, it's, this has well, global you, implications. Yeah, and most manufacturers proceed on their automobile production uh, as a global market. Okay. The, the U.S. is part of a global market for everybody. I can tell you one well-known Japanese uh, manufacturing Fracture told me, and one of the biggest told me, they make no money in California. <laughs> that right now in California, one out of ten of the cars they sell is hybrid. Under the new, under the Obama standards, if you like, one out of two of their cars would have to be hybrid. Uh, GM, I guess Fiat. Fiat has publicly said they lose fourteen thousand dollars on every electric vehicle they sell. Wow. So, so we have a problem. I mean, the consumers want X. And the, some people in the environmental community and the government want Y. And we don't seem to have a very good way of sort of squaring that circle. Yeah, amen to that. You know, sometimes you can, yeah. you can reach a, a decision which may have, um, you know, uh, a, a good basis, at least by in, in somebody else's analysis, but you announce it and you push it forward in a way that offends people. And that's happened so many times in this administration. Right. Even if they're right, uh, they're not handling it very well. But you and I can uh, I watch. Could, I could not agree more. Yeah. You and I can watch and we can see it going forward. Yes. I'm sure there's more, more shoes to drop on this one, Lou. You know, this, this is going to be a big fight over the next 12 months, and uh, there's going to be a lot of negotiations with California. I think some of the administration will hope that California will come to the table and they can reach a compromise on a single national standard, because I do believe if you watch the auto companies, they kept going around saying, well, these standards are too difficult to meet. But we should have only one standard. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. One thing is clear that Jeff Sessions will be busy. This will be his second case against California within the last month. So <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It's just the federal this government versus drag. California. <laughs> well thank you, Lou. Well, the, the, the problem is this could drag on for years. Yes, I agree. Uh, and we'll cover it, won't we? <laughs> yes, yeah, sure. Okay, Jay. Thank you so much. Lou Pugliarisi, uh, CEO of ePrink, who took the time off to talk to us today. So much. We really right. appreciate it very much, Lou. All right, Jim. Take care. Talk Bye. to you next time. Bye.